In our search for methods to construct new groups from old groups, we've considered subgroups, so these are groups inside of larger groups, and we considered quotient groups. These are groups modulo normal subgroups. Let's look at some more constructions. One thing we can do, we're going to identify some special subgroups. So if I have S, some non-empty subset in G, I'll call the centralizer of S in G. Subgroup It's going to be the set of all X in our group, such that X commutes with every element in S. So we're saying that X centralizes S. Now that's the same as saying X times S equals S times X for all S and S. We can rewrite this part here as x s x inverse equals s. So if we conjugate s by x, we get s back. Now, special cases, if s is equal to the identity element, every element in the group commutes with the identity element, so we have that the centralizer of s in g is equal to g itself. If s is equal to our group, then the special case is just the center of G, which we've seen before. So the center of G will be abelian, and it'll be normal in the group. Now note, by this example here, we see that S need not be a subset of the centralizer of S. Okay, so G is usually not going to be a subset of the center. For a similar construction, We'll fix a subgroup H and G. We'll define the normalizer of H and G to be the set of all X and G that normalize H. So that just means if I conjugate the subgroup H by X, we get H back. Or X H X inverse is equal to H. One way we could think of this, the normalizer of H and G, is going to be the largest subgroup of G that contains H as a normal subgroup. So that just means H is a normal subgroup in N, then N is going to be contained in the normalizer of H. Some facts that we have, the centralizer of H, okay, so H is a subgroup, but it's also a subset. This is always contained in the normalizer of H. We also have that H itself is contained in the normalizer of H. Okay, that's just closure under multiplication. If H is a normal subgroup in G, then the normalizer in H is going to be all of G. And if G is abelian, then the normalizer of H is equal to G, and the centralizer of H is equal to G also. So when we're using abelian groups, centralizers and normalizers, not so interesting. Play more of a factor when we're working with non-abelian groups. Let's show that the normalizer is a subgroup of G. We'll leave the centralizer as an exercise. Now, to show that we have a subgroup, we need to show three things. Close under multiplication, close under inversion, and non-empty. For close under multiplication, we'll pick X and Y in the normalizer. We'll show that the product XY is also in the normalizer. So, if we conjugate H by X, we have H conjugate by y, we also have h. So let's see what happens if we conjugate by xy. Now, our rule for the inverse of a product, we just reverse the order, put an inverse on each term. So I have y inverse, x inverse. Now on the inside, we have y h y inverse, which by assumption is equal to h. This collapses to x h x inverse, which by assumption collapses to h also. So if we conjugate by xy, we get h. So xy is in the normalizer. For the inverses, we suppose x is in the normalizer. We want to show x inverse is also in the normalizer. Now, we have conjugation of h by x gives us h. So I'm going to push the x to the other side as x inverse, the x inverse to the other side as x. And that gives us that if we conjugate Okay, by x inverse, 
Noting that x inverse inverse is equal to x, we get h. So that means x inverse is in h, and we have closed under our inversion. Finally, the normalizer is not empty. So we see right away, if we use the identity element, okay, we have e, h, e. We multiply by e, we do nothing, so we get h back. So non-empty. Okay, in fact, as we noted on the previous board, we have all of the h inside the normalizer of h. For a concrete example, let's consider d8 the symmetry group of the square. So we have our square, we label 1, 2, 3, 4, going counterclockwise. If we list out the elements, the top row is the rotations, the bottom row is the reflections. D8 has eight elements, so by Lagrange's theorem, if we have a subgroup, its order must divide eight, so we have one, two, four, or eight for our options. We've also seen that the center of D8 is equal to the identity and the product of disjoint two cycles, one, three, two, four. Okay, note, one goes to three, two goes to four, we're rotating by 180 degrees. Now, let's consider, okay, I'll take the centralizer of the element one, three. So what can go in there? Well, we have the identity element, we have one, three itself. Note, we could take any powers of one, three, they'll commute with one, three, but one, three squared is gonna be the identity, so we won't get anything new thinking that way. If we consider the labels we're not using, then the two cycle two, four will commute with one, three. Then because we have a subgroup, the product will also be in the centralizer. Now, could we have any other elements in here? Well, if we did, we have four elements. The next number for subgroup orders is eight. So if I had any more elements, we would have the entire group. And that would mean one, three, is in the center of our group. But we know that doesn't happen, so this is gonna be the centralizer. Note, because the order of this subgroup is four, it's normal in D8 by the index two theorem. So the index here, number of cosets, eight over four is two. Now, for this fact, we could check directly also. If we conjugate one, three by one, two, we get two, three, and that shows if we conjugate, we're not getting one, three back. So it has to be order four. Now for the normalizer, okay, well, if I conjugate this subgroup here, the identity element has to go to the identity element. So one, three would have to go to one, three. So that means we're not gonna be the entire group by this calculation here. We know the centralizer of one, three it's gonna be in the normalizer of the subgroup. So we have all of these elements. And again, because we have four and we don't have all eight of them, this is gonna be our normalizer. For a different example, let's try the centralizer of the rotation, one, two, three, four. Same as before, we have the identity element. We have the element itself. If we square the element, that'll commute with the element. So that's gonna be one, three, two, four. And then if we take the third power, we have one, four, three, two. And that's also the inverse. If we try to put any more elements in there, that would mean one, two, three, four is in the center. We know that doesn't happen, so we stop here. Again, this is gonna be a normal subgroup in D8 by the index two theorem. Now, if we take Okay, the subgroup of rotations, okay, so they're just generated by one, two, three, four. Okay, that's the same as our centralizer. Then we're gonna have all of D8. Because our subgroup here has index two, it's normal. So that means the normalizer is all the group. Now, do we have options when G is abelian? Not only do we have an option, this option is the punchline for finite abelian groups. So this is gonna be direct product of groups. In this case, the external direct product. So I'll have G and H groups, not necessarily abelian. We'll form the direct product 
g cross h. The set will be all ordered pairs, g comma h, where g is in g, h is in h. For the multiplication, we multiply slot-wise. So g1 h1 times g2 h2 is g1 g2 comma h1 h2. For the identity element, we just use identity for g comma identity for h. And for inverses, gh inverse is equal to g inverse h inverse. So I'll leave it to you to verify that these work. Now, there's no reason to stay with just two groups. We take the direct product of any finite number of groups that we want. And so we're going to have a slot for each group that we use. If our g and h are abelian, then the direct product will be abelian also. For the cardinality, okay, if our g and h are finite, the number of elements in g cross h is just the number of elements in g times the number of elements in h. Okay, so that's just going to be set theory. If we have two finite sets, then order of the product is the product of the orders. Now, here's the punchline. Once we have the direct product, we have the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. So this says if we have G of finite abelian group, then G is going to be isomorphic. We'll see more of isomorphism later, but this just means it's the same group, just with different labels. So I can relabel our group in the following way. We could write G as a direct product of these cyclic groups. So these are our modular integer groups. Condition that we have, that the first number be greater than one, and then we'll have that n1 divides n2, n2 divides n3, all the way up through nk minus one divides nk. We're not gonna prove this now. We will probably much later, but we'll use this because it's a good thing for examples. Now, for a concrete example of a direct product, okay, the basic, we're gonna take the two group with itself. So we have Z2 cross Z2 and our operations addition. So what elements do we have? We'll take all possible pairs of elements from these two groups. So I have 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. 0 is the identity element in Z2. So 0, 0 is our identity element in the direct product. That'll have order 1. For the other elements, Okay, we'll note if we add them to themselves, we get, okay, so for instance, one zero plus one zero gives me two zero. Since we're over Z2, that's gonna turn into zero zero. So I have the identity. So all of these elements have order two. Now to compare, let's consider another four element group. Okay, so I have Z mod four under addition. The elements here are gonna be zero, one, two, three. Zero is our identity, so it is order one. 2, if we add 2 plus 2, we get 4, which goes to 0, our identity. So 2 has order 2. For 1, we have 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4, goes to 0, so order 4. Same way for 3. So we note these two groups look very different, okay? The orders of their elements are not matching up, but we need more language to make this precise. So the, this idea is going to be called isomorphism.